Hi everyone. Uh, so what I'm going to do uh, with this tutorial video is uh, just go over a little bit about the process of uh, using Agisoft uh, MetaShape, um, really basic um, sequence of, of tools that you're going to use. Um, I'm also going to go over an important pre-processing step. Um, so this is uh, the division of um, your photos into what, what Photoscan or, or MetaShape actually what it's called now uh, uh, breaks into what they call chunks. Um, so these are, are photos that are likely to align with each other. Um, and how to do some really simple masking, um, at least to get a, a, a best guess at the mask using um, a process that where you, you take photos that are of the background um, that do not have your image in the, the shot. Um, this is assuming that you're going to be using a, um, a turntable technique, um, which we'll, we'll see uh, in this video. Um, and how to mask those photos out so that we get the most out of it and we have nice clean edges around our model. Um, so uh, what I want to do really quickly here is let's just start a new project. Um, this is the sort of finished, this is where we're headed. Um, this is fish, the finished version. And I'm going to start a new project. And one of the things I want to make sure that we get an idea about how to start is to know that when we shoot our photographs, we're going to be uh, breaking them into pieces, as I said, what PhotoScan, or sorry, what MetaShape calls chunks. Um, and before we shoot each one of these new, uh, what I will call camera positions, um, so we have the camera on a tripod shooting into a light tent with the object on a turntable. Um, what we'll do is we'll take one photo before the object arrives. Okay, and so this is a quick uh, uh, explanation of how you take the photo first and then you add the object. So one thing that's going to happen in here that, that you need to keep be aware of is just as I kind of click between here and here, you're noticing a few things are going to change because this isn't a perfectly lit um, uh, this isn't a perfectly lit um, light tent. Um, I think it's it's an okay data set. Uh, it works well. Um, what I what I'm doing with this data set is I'm especially because it's a light colored object. You would ordinarily not use a white background for this. Um, but what this uh, this data set really does is it shows you what you're probably more likely to get, which is not an optimal um, shooting condition um, where you might get some areas where the background might try to blur into the object. Um, and I want to show you just what's going to happen when that when when you have to deal with that problem. OK, so the first thing I want to do is is just take out these images. You can see here's another set. You can see I've moved from a straight on view to a slightly above view right here. So. ABC0021 uh, is going to be one of our background images. And then you can see the, the final one where we go a really low angle to try to shoot the uh, bottom of the object after the object's been rotated onto the, uh, the turntable. This is our third one. So the first thing I want to do is just create a new folder here. I'm just going to call this backgrounds. Uh, and I'm going to hold down control. That is, if I'm on a on a PC, and I'm going to have to assume that we're on a PC for this, but you, you all should know um, how this works. Um, I'm going to select just the images I want that are background images, and I'm going to drag them into this folder, okay, get them out of the way. Um, and just to make sure that I, I have them straight, I'm going to call this uh, background one, and I'm going to rename each of these accordingly. And here is our background three. Okay, so each of them listed accordingly. Perfect. Okay, so let's go to our owl video is set up, and we have a new a uh, a new scene here for MetaShape. Um, so let's add um, our first chunk, some cameras to the first chunk. And when they say cameras, they really mean uh, photos. So you can either right click and say add add photos, or under workflow go to add photos. So I'll add my photos here. Um, I know that I have them in this owl video folder here. So I'm going to select all of the ones from here to about here. And you can see 
just in their tree view image, I, I really recommend looking at it this way. These are the ones that I want for that first chunk. And I'll hit open. Okay, so there are 16 files for that one. Um, right up here, you can say add photos or add chunk. I'm going to add another chunk. Select that chunk and then add photos here. And I'll add my second set, which starts here and continues on to here. So I'll just hold down shift and select those, hit open. Okay, there's 17 for that one. Repeat the process for the third. And I'll select all of these low angle ones. Okay. All right, good. So there's a, a few things that we need to do. If I want to, to preview the image, let's go back to our first chunk here. I'm going to double click on it and just kind of get a, a pretty good idea um, of what is happening um, with this as I as I click through, right? So it's it's moving um, clockwise um, as it moves around, and you can see if, if I zoom in, there's going to be some odd spots here where that it's going to be hard for that background to understand. Um, and and as we showed before, also the sh the object itself casts a shadow, and so there will all always be an issue, probably right about here and right about here. Um, where the background image is not going to match what it looks like when the object is in there. And that's basically just because it's not a very well lit scene. Um, so, but that's okay. We can still get pretty good results with this. Uh, so the first thing I want to do is I can right click on any of these images and I'm going to go to uh, masks and I'm going to say import masks. And I'm going to say not from alpha, but from background right here. And I'm going to replace it. And the file name template, this is this is uh, a little silly that Metashape does it this way, um, but we have to type in what we're looking for um, and the file extension. Uh, and then what it's going to say, and I'm going to say all cameras because it's going to do that to everything in the chunk. The tolerance is not especially important. Um, I might drag it. I mean... It, it, it can get significant depending on your data set, so I shouldn't say it's not important. I'm going to drag it just a little bit down to say, no, I don't, I just by experience, I know 7 works okay. Um, and then when I, I hit enter, it's going to ask me, okay, where are where is that file? Um, and if I go back to our videos, I can select backgrounds. And this is why I think it's a little, it's kind of a little dumb uh, that you can't actually just select the file that you're looking for. Um, but I can hit select folder, and it'll look... And what this is going to do is it's going to generate the masks automatically for you throughout this data set. This saves you a ton of time. Um, now, I'm working on a desktop computer right now, and you can see that it's kind of giving us a, an OK start here. Um, I'm working on a desktop computer that has a pretty decent graphics card, so this is probably going to go quite a bit faster than it does for you, um, up to about twice to three times as long, depending on what process you're watching. Um, so I just wanted to make sure I mentioned that quickly. So this shouldn't take long here. We're going to generate masks, and you can see that there are some spots. This is the unmasked area here. So here where the object is, you can see it's grabbing some stuff we don't really want it to, right? Um, and it's also leaving some things in that we want uh, that we want masked. Okay, so but this is not really a, a too big of a problem. It can be a little tedious, I'll, I'll admit. Um, but nonetheless, you have to select this rectangle tool for the easy stuff, and you can just go ahead and drag select and there's there's a couple ways to do this if, if you prefer to just keep using the mouse your your touch screen that's fine i prefer to remember that it's control shift a to add and control shift s to subtract so i'll just hit add selection here and you can see that adds to the mask i'll do the same thing over here but i'm going to hold down control shift and a and that for me is a little bit faster to just keep doing that um, and I'm just going to get a couple of these pieces. But then when I zoom in here, I can see it's grabbing some stuff I don't want it to. Um, so other than the, the super fast rectangle tool, we also have a magic wand and something that they call the intelligence scissors. It's basically just a lasso tool. And I'm going to just click around here. And instead of adding to the mask, which remember is going to say, I don't, I don't want any processing there. I want to remove this. So it's control shift and S to remove that. And the other way to do this, I'm going to do this one more time over here. And finish it up is to say, right click. There we are. 
it looks like that's not behaving itself. So control, I would simply say control shift S. Um, that's just the fastest way from, uh, in my opinion, to do this. Um, so, you know, the bad news for this is if you get a pretty bad um, initial selection like this, um, this can be a lot of manual work. Um, you also have a magic wand tool um, that you can go and mask out um, something like this. Um, but you'll notice that it's its initial settings are really way blown out. So you can go down to magic wand settings here. And I'm just going to pull this kind of arbitrarily until it, it starts to get what I want. That's actually not too bad. Um, that's a pretty decent selection. So I just click one time in one particular place. And then uh, hit control shift A. Maybe do it again. And you can see I'm starting to remove things that I really want to remove. Okay. And this is a little bit forgiving. I mean, really, if I was being super particular, I might mask this out a little bit better. Um, just to see if we can get a better um, uh, a better capture initially, I'm going to go down to masks and import these masks, and I'm going to maybe bump this up to 9. Um, I think... I think actually my I'm going the wrong way here. Let me let me switch this down to five, um, and then it's gonna it's certainly gonna give us more. Um, it's gonna give us more of the background um, than we maybe initially want. That's gonna be fine. Um, but I would just want to do a quick comparison, and I recommend this just to see if your initial settings are really terrible and you're doing a lot of masking uh, by hand then you know, it sometimes can be faster just to try an automated process um, with slightly different settings and see you know, where's the sweet spot. So in this instance, by moving it down to five, it's less sensitive. It's grabbing less stuff in here where that shadow is different than it was in the background image. But it's also giving, a, it's not grabbing quite as much of the object, which is, in my opinion, a little bit more kind of annoying to have to mask out. Um, so to me, this is a slightly better uh, example I could just move to the rectangle selection and just kind of get rid of some of these things quickly. And maybe use my magic wand right down here. Control Shift A. And already I feel like this is a slightly better capture. Um, and when I'm okay with that, um, which, you know, I really probably would pro want to do at least you know, clean this up a little bit and control shift S. Um, I can move on to the next one. And you can see there's going to be some places where this is just going to keep, you know, for some whatever reason, I think partially just because this little shadowed object is so similar to the color of the background immediately behind it. You can imagine that. Um, that's kind of why we're getting that. Um, this, If you shoot better, honestly, this probably will not be nearly as bad um, to deal with. Um, so since this is really pretty easy uh, to understand at this stage, I'm just going to finish this one image up um, so you can see a couple of them. Remembering that there's going to be some issues just about in the corners. Um, and then I will pause the video and I will show you what happens after you've done your masking. So to show you what happens uh, with these background images, you have to repeat this process for every chunk. Um, so what I'm going to do is just show you very quickly. I won't show you chunk three since you can see it, but you do since you do have to do it for each one. I might as well show you this part. Um, you're going to go to mask and import masks again. And instead of background one, all you're going to do is change that to background two. Um, the tolerance you can actually probably leave about the same, and we'll see how it does. Um, and we're going to say all cameras, hit OK. And then it's in the same folder as background. It's looking for the correct image. I'll hit select folder. And this should process fairly quickly. Yeah, and this is a little bit, you know, this is maybe a little bit too forgiving, but it's OK. I can see just from that first, uh, that first mask that, you know, it's not. Ideally, maybe we would be cranking that up to six or seven, maybe. But there's always a trade-off um, as these things go, um, where you're you're going to have to either be masking the background or or unmasking the object, um, depending on how high or low you you set that tolerance. Okay, good. 
Um, so we've seen that for the two. We know the next process. It's just like you've been doing before. Um, I'm just going to select all of these. Control, Control Shift A. I'm going to pause really quick here and show you when they're all masked. Okay. So just to show you the the next set, let's discard this for now. Um, I'm going to open up the Al Photogrammetry project uh, from before. And we're going to see, um, right here, you can see I even left a few, you know, little gaps here and there um, in that initial set. And you can see that I, I was wanted to sort of see what it was going to do if I, like, just sort of allowed a little bit of junk to happen on the bottom, you know, maybe only masked a few. Um, this is this is not um, the most meticulous method. Um, obviously, you would probably want to, you know, clean this up a little bit. But... Um, I, I wanted to also show you that the software can also be a little bit forgiving. So, um, you know, if you really want the best results, absolutely mask everything out. But otherwise, you might even be able to get away with masking every third or fourth to make sure that you don't get too many matching points there. Um, so let's do this. Um, our next step here is to match our photos. OK, so we shouldn't we don't actually have this model ready yet. So I'm going to pretend that that's not. That hasn't been pre-processed. Um, so once we have a chunk highlighted right here, I'm going to go to Workflow and say Align Photos. And here's where we can get into the settings. I'm not going to use the time, your time to explain what all of these settings mean necessarily and how to optimize them. Um, the short version of this is you want to always keep your, your accuracy at least at high or medium. Do not go to low accuracy because you're just going to get kind of a junky model. Um, that's a just a little bit of free advice there. Uh, your key point limit, your key point, uh, that all that uh, number corresponds to is how many uh, individual things and in whatever we call things, right? So, so maybe this little bit of the eye is a thing, it's a feature. And, it, and the algorithm, the SIFT algorithm that's running through for photogrammetry is being able to determine mostly based on things like um, color contrast and, and the color of neighbor pixels whether or not something qualifies as a as a point as a key object um, so it's going to say for each one um, how many possible things could possibly be in the image and 40,000 for a thing like this is quite enough um, this number the higher it gets is going to take you the longer it's going to take you to process your images um, and then when you get down to tie points, that's how many uh, points can be in common between two photos before it says, OK, I've got enough. I'm going to move on to the next possible match. So try to match uh, five to six and then five to seven, etc. So as you can imagine, the more photos you add, it actually is exponentially longer in terms of processing. Um, these are your defaults, 40 and 4. I'm going to bump this up to 5 just because I know I got a little bit better uh, results out of that last time. Um, and we're going to exclude these stationary tie points. Don't worry about that really uh, very much right now. Um, so I'm going to say OK. Um, and this is telling me because I've already processed some other things down the line in the workflow that it's going to undo all that. And I'm going to say, yeah, that's OK. And as you can see, this is going to move fairly quickly for me. This is just the detecting point stage. Now, I've got a 32-core CPU as well as a really good CPU, so that's that's happening really, really fast. Um, if I go over to the model now, here's for my first chunk. I've already got what's called a point cloud of the model, and it's looking pretty good. Um, it's also telling me where my photos are, um, and that's, that's quite helpful uh, just to see how things are lining up. All right, uh, so let's move on to the next one. Um, and I'm just going to re uh, repeat this process for this one, um, pretending that this has not been processed already. I'm going to align the photos, keep the same settings, hit OK. okay and while this is processing, I'm going to hit pause so we can get to the next step. OK, so I've processed all three of these chunks. Um, and you can see here's the first one, and that's giving me a pretty good idea of where these really evenly spaced, because remember it was on a, uh, on a turntable. These evenly spaced camera positions are, you can see this is the one where we moved the tripod up and did another round of spinning. You can see this is the last one where what we were really trying to do is bringing the, bring the uh, tripod pretty low 
so that we could capture the inside because this is slightly hollow in here um, and then also get a little bit better uh, capture of the top so the good news is that because I did a pretty good job of masking all of these photos matched you can see that there's a checkbox a check mark next to each of these um, so we're ready to process our next stage um, which is the dense point cloud um, and we need this in order to align the chunks um, you can go straight to a mesh if you had like one chunk for the entire thing for instance if you were not using the turntable technique um, but for us we do need this so i'm going to go to build dense point cloud and this will be grayed out fortunately for us it's really simple software um, this will be grayed out if you haven't already aligned your photo so you know what to do next um, again, I'm going to keep it on higher. High, we're going to reuse. We can reuse depth maps or create new ones. Uh, this is a process that had already been run, so this really wouldn't be available to you initially. The depth uh, filtering should be fine as, as mild, and I'll hit OK there. Um, and then I'll show you what that looks like after it processes. Okay, so once it's processed, you're going to see it's just going to look about the same as it did before, and that's simply because you haven't clicked on the visualization tool to look at the dense point cloud. And I'm going to zoom in here and just sort of show you that really this is doing a very, very good job. Um, there's something that's happening here that you may not uh, really like a whole lot. And, and you can see this is probably uh, certainly uh, an example where we probably didn't do a very good job of masking um, down here on the bottom. Um, and I can say just by looking at it, certainly that is the case. Um, but there's there's good news. Um, so if, if you do have that problem, you've already gotten to this stage. Um, when you go to build your dense point cloud, one of the advanced setting is to um, to calculate your point confidence, which I, I really recommend doing. Um, point confidence means um, how many uh, if this is an object, is it visible to one image, two images, three images? Um, and you can actually filter this out. Um, if you go under tools, up to dense point cloud and say filter by confidence you can say I want things that have a minimum of three cameras visible to at least three cameras and I'm gonna hit OK and you'll notice it gets rid of some stuff it certainly you know causes some holes that we may not have had like up here um, but since we did capture the top of the head in another another chunk we're actually okay with that and more importantly it really did clean up this bottom quite a bit um, so that's just a quick trick um, for you all to just to see. Um, and we're going to do the same thing for each of these. You can see we're visualizing the dense cloud here. Um, this was the, the, the chunk that was uh, intended to get the top of the model. You can see there's a little chunk in the ear. Maybe that was a bad masking situation. Um, not too bad. Um, and you can see here's the third example where we were really trying to capture inside and you can see it got pitch dark in these images so really it has there's almost no kind of model texture information here it's all kind of exactly the same um, pixel kind of color which means that it's not going to be able to get give you too much information in there but that's so that's kind of okay we're really not too worried about that um, this was you can see that these masks are not especially good um, you know, in that last image, but uh, this was actually processed with a different set of masks that I did much more meticulously. So um, if you try to use a really bad mask and, and you don't get uh, a result that's this good, that's why. Uh, so our next step, uh, step for this is to align our chunks. Uh, so each of these chunks are gonna come in and what they're gonna do is you do not wanna fix the scale. You wanna allow these objects to register is, is a term that we use to each other where they're going to check and keep doing some really basic processing to keep moving the object the different chunks uh, along each other until things really start to fit well um, and i'm just going to hit uh, ok on this and then show you what it looks like um, in just a moment okay you can see that the aligning process is is moving fairly quickly here matching up all of these points Okay, great. So one of the things that will happen right away is when you switch between the different chunks, they're all going to be in the same position, right? That's what that aligning is doing. Now, the next step after that is to merge them together, and that's going to create a new, an entirely new set 
um, down here, a new chunk essentially in the bottom down here, where we're going to merge the dense clouds. Um, I might as well check merging the depth maps as well. It's just a way that we're going to create our mesh later. I'll hit OK. OK, so this has gone about 20 seconds. Not too bad. Uh, we now have a merged chunk, which you can see here. And, you know, there's a little bit of, you know, if I was going to do this optimally, I probably would have filtered each of those chunks before I did the merge because that's kind of messy. Um, you know, they they will let you do things like um, once it's created, you can do a freeform selection and maybe try to, I don't know, select all this stuff. Um, I really just don't recommend that and hit delete. You know, I don't recommend working that way. I, I think it's better to mask um, and it's certainly um, more accurate. Um, so we now have our dense point cloud all for one mesh all together. Um, and we're, I suppose, relatively uh, comfortable with it. So our final, um, our final workflow process um, is going to be to build our mesh. Well, our second to last, I'll put it that way. So we're going to turn this into a mesh so that you don't, when you zoom in, you don't see these points, right? Um, and just to sort of give you an idea, we're looking at a, at a model that has 12 million points in it. Okay, so it really is a dense amount of data. Um, let's go to workflow and build our mesh. Um, really pretty simple process. I would leave the face count at high because it actually doesn't save you any time in processing to what we call decimate it down to medium or low. It's gonna process it pretty high. Um, from the get-go and then kind of bring it down. So it's actually just as fast to leave it high. And then you can, can build low polygon models um, later if you if you need to. Uh, so this will be the source data. I would I prefer to use depth maps um, instead of the dense point cloud. We can go into that when when uh, I speak to you all in person. But um, I think this is, this is these are pretty decent settings uh, right here. So I'm just going to hit OK. And I'll hit pause because this does take just a, a minute or so. Okay, you can see about a minute has has gone by. Um, calculating vertex colors just takes a couple more seconds, I believe. Uh, again, for you all, one minute is very, very fast. Um, just so you know, if you're doing this on your laptops uh, and you have one chunk with, I don't know, let's say, all 47 cameras in them, this is going to take more like a half an hour. Um, so it, it, there's a really big difference in processing uh, power for this, uh, for photogrammetry, for this process. So uh, just FYI. Um, and you might think, okay, well, again, it's not, it, I haven't seen any visual difference. Again, you have to go to the next, uh, the next uh, visualization kind of technique, which is the model. And now you can see that this is a polygonal mesh. Um, you can see some of the fun stuff that's going on. There is a hole in here, um, but there's a few different things that you can visualize. You can visualize it as a wireframe. Um, I can bring it down to quote unquote model confidence, which I really like. So these are areas in red where it, it isn't as certain about what's in there. Um, and absolutely on the underside, you're seeing there wasn't a whole lot of overlap with the, um, with the photos. And so you're seeing that uh, it's not very certain about that area, which makes perfect sense when you look at an image like this. It's not going to know what's kind of on the underside up underneath here very well. Um, so uh, really quickly, let me go back to, to, to the model view. These are just a few ways to visualize the model. The last thing that you're going to want in order just to get a, a very pretty model is you don't want to uh, visualize it just with the point, the vertex point colors. You actually want the photographs act as a texture on top of it. So this last step is to build texture. And you can see again, this is no longer uh, grayed out, so I can I can run it. Um, I definitely recommend uh, 8192 is quite large. I would recommend not going for for almost any object above 4092 unless it's something that is going to be visualized from really really up close. Um, the all of these sets um, diffuse map that's what you're actually creating diffuse simply means the color map um, you're going to use your images um, and generic mapping mode is fine that means it's going to sort of spread out it's going to create a, an image texture that sort of unfolds the object and spreads it kind of arbitrarily 
Um, so I'll hit OK here. And this will just take a second as well, and I'll pause. OK, so we've processed. It took uh, maybe two minutes or so. Um, if we go over here, we're going to see model texture is now not grayed out. We can see the texture pop in, and you really see a big difference there, right? So this is, uh, this is a pretty good texture because no matter how you visualize um, this in any game engine or in any WebGL viewer um, that has a, a light source, as you move that light source around, um, the, the shadows are not baked into it, right? So it's not dark in here on purpose. Um, so you'll actually get a, a nice um, visualization um, for a moving... Um, uh, a moving light source or anything like that. So it's going to look really good. Uh, the next thing I want to show you really quickly is to show how to uh, align the the model. Um, you, you might be able to tell that you know Z is supposed to be up, which you see right down here. And this is clearly not the top of the object's head. Um, if you want to move it, I go to predefined views and click on top. And then since this is the top view, I'm not going to move my view, but I do want to uh, to move the object. So I'm going to rotate the object and I'm just going to spin this so I'm looking at the top of the head. And if I click sort of on the outside here, I can spin it this way. I'm just going to get this generally in the right position. And it's not going to be correct at first. Um, another thing that I can do uh, here is um, if we look under model and predefined views, we can also um, switch our view mode to orthographic, which means that it's not going, things are, that are further away are not going to taper into the distance. And that can really help you line things up. So I'll go to predefined views and go to front. And now I can just sort of click here and rotate and maybe use, I like to use the bottom. So you can see there's like a, there's a little bit of a, a flat bottom to it, which is helpful. I can drag this down to the bottom here and just see the way that this line lines up with it. That's just a, a quick trick that I like to use um, to help me kind of be more certain that I'm getting the object um, as, as flat as I possibly can. Um, and I'm going to want to repeat this for a few different views. So I'm going to go to predefined views and look at maybe the right side. And that's looking OK on the bottom. Um, you know, it, it tilts a little bit forward. That's actually naturally what the object really does. Um, so that I just want to really make sure that everything is set up here. And when I'm okay with that, um, now I can see um, in our perspective view, if I hit the five key, um, we can kind of rotate around. And now the axis for the object is is matching what would be normal for the world. And that's going to be important when you uh, import this file into other software. So when I am ready to export it, I'm going to go to export and export model. Um, and I recommend there's a few different um, file formats I recommend. OBJ is very, very interoperable. Um, so an, an object file here. Um, Kalata, also another object, uh, another interoperable file format. But um, if you want to bring things into an Autodesk software or if you're going to bring it into a game engine, there's very few. Now, it's not an open source da uh, data format, I'm, I must say, but it is one of the best ones, which is FBX. Um, and we can call this OWL um, just, for the f just for the fun of it, um, OWL model. And I'll hit save, and it's going to give me some options. Um, what I really like about this is um, we can actually embed the texture directly into it. Um, one of the, that's one of the main reasons that I really like um, uh, this file format. Um, so I'm going to hit OK. And that's pretty much it. Um, inside of our file folder, you know, we will have um, in here in OWL, you know, we're going to have our OBJ, which comes with a material file and a JPEG texture. Um, we're going to have just a single file for the OWL model FBX. Okay, so that's how the process works. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting some things, but, um, you know, there, there are lots of different ways to visualize uh, the data once you have it. Um, but this is a, a sort of a, a quick way to, to show you how masking really works um, and how important it is to your end result. Um, so with that, I'm going to conclude and I'm looking forward to speaking with you all um, soon next week.